Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We're in a summer series called Stories of Jesus. We've been looking at stories and miracles and healings that Jesus did. He lived for 33 years, yet his ministry only lasted three years. The last verse in the book of John says, I suppose that if we wrote down everything that Jesus did, the world could not contain the books written about what he did. And he did that all in three years. Three years. I then looked at myself and became self-loathing and said, have I done enough in 27 years of ministry to fill a business card, let alone a book, compared to Jesus in three years? There's this urgency of doing what God has called us to do. Today, we're going to look at a story in the book of Mark. It's called The Madman of Gadaria. Has anybody ever heard of that story before? The mad, a few of you, okay. So we're going to study this out. If you've heard this story before, if you've studied it before, I hope to give you some new detail and information into this story. But for the mass majority that have never heard this story, I hope that you can see some of the underlying details of what Jesus did in this passage. It's in the book of Mark, although Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this same story. We're going to look at Mark's account today. We're going to read in the New King James, and it says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gadarene. And when they had come out of the boat, immediately there met Jesus out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Very strange. We're going to break that down in a minute. But look at that. One part of him came and worshipped Jesus. And then one part of him said, Why are you here? What have I got to do with you? Right? There's something that splits there. Okay. For Jesus said, Come out of you, you unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And the man answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Yo, that's some blockbuster video stuff right there. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine or pigs was feeding there near the mountainside. So all of the demons begged Jesus, saying, send us into the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. And those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told others what had happened. Verse 17, then they begged Jesus to depart from their region. That's wild. Why? Why don't you want him to stay? We're going to break this down. We've got a lot to talk about today. We're going to go line upon line, looking at what's happening here. But I want to tell you this, big point today, not only is Jesus a healer of the body, he is also a deliverer of the mind. A deliverer of the mind. I don't know what possibly could go through your mind in a day. Some people have the most cheer-filled, positive mind in the entire world. But then there's other people like myself who are not as see the silver lining. And maybe you deal with negative thoughts. Maybe there's somebody who deals with depression. Maybe someone who deals with anxiety. Someone who deals with anger. Understand this. Jesus is not only the healer of the body. 
but also the mind and the emotions and your will. Okay? Again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all tell this story. They do tell it a little bit different. Okay? If I all asked you what color sneakers Pastor Chris had on, we could probably get 10 different tales as to what color sneakers Pastor Chris had on today. Right? Because I think they're black and white. But it's because we're all in different seats, we don't remember, we're going to make something up. I don't believe that anything in the Bible is made up. But I believe that there's different aspects and there's different viewpoints of the same exact stories. Today we're going to study Mark. Let's go back to verse 1. Then they came out of the boat to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gadarene. And there, as they came out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs came towards Jesus with an unclean spirit. Matthew and Mark say that they were in the region of Gadarene. Luke says that they were in the region of Gerasene. There's been scholar and theological debates to say that there's a contradiction in the Bible. Two of them say Gadarene. One of them says Gerasene. See, there's a contradiction. Tell me this, and you would understand this because you are from New York. Is there a contradiction for me saying that I'm from New York and someone else saying that they're from New York City? Is that a contradiction? No, it's the same thing. If I am anywhere but New York, and I say, oh, what's up, man? I'm from New York. Oh, dude, I went to Manhattan once. Well, I'm not from New York City. I'm from upstate. But I hate saying that I'm from upstate because I'm only 60 miles outside of the city. Like, we're the lowest upstate there possibly is. Right? We're the most meaningless upstate that there is upstate. Because when you say upstate, you think Buffalo, Syracuse, right? That's upstate. They way up there. They get like four feet of snow. That's kind of the same thing here, right? They're from Gadarian or Gadarene, and they're from Gerasene. It's both, right? One's like the state and one's the city. No contradiction. I just want you to understand, when you read your Bible and you see these things, pick them up. Ask these questions. How come there's two different words? It's, it's like New York. It's both the state and the city. Okay? I want you to get that today. Notice that the scripture says that this man had an unclean spirit. Why, why does it say unclean spirit? Because you can have a clean spirit, right? You can have the Holy Spirit. You can have the spirit of God. The spirit that he had was not that. This was a demonic spirit. This is a demonic um, possession that he has. The Greek word here is literally the word impure. Impure which means these spirits are there to pollute this man's soul. No demonic spirit is clean. Therefore, the Bible wants us to know that we're not talking about a godly spirit, but this man is controlled and being tormented by something ungodly. Verse 3 and 4. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and had pulled them apart. And the shackles were broken pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. This man had supernatural strength. He had supernatural strength. Because of the demons that were within him. The scripture says that no man could tame him. And I love the fact that Jesus did not come on the scene to tame this guy. He didn't come to tame him. He came to deliver him. He came to set him free. Right? Not just tame him. Not just teach him how to deal with his demons. But cast him out. Deliver him. Get it out of his life. Right? There's some things that we should not settle for happening in our lives. We should not just say, okay, well, this is just the way it's supposed to be. No, there's some things we need to get out of our lives, man. We need to get them delivered from these things. Mark 5.5. 5. And always night and day he was in the mountains and the tombs crying out and cutting himself. This man was dwelling in uninhabited places. He was living in graveyards. He was living around dead things. Dead things and in dead places. And I got to tell you, you will never fulfill the life-giving purpose of God hanging out in dead places playing with dead things. 
how does this apply to your life? There's some things that God has called you out of that you're not supposed to go back and play with. You're not going to find the life-giving, spiritual relationships that you're looking for sitting at the bar. It's a dead place. It's a dead place. The club's a dead place. Right? Oh, it's fun for a moment, but it's a dead place. You're not going to find the life-giving things that God's called you to do playing in dead places with dead things. Somebody in here today, man, you're still playing around with a dead relationship. Keep going back to that same dog vomit. You calling my ex-boyfriend dog vomit? Well, I was talking about your girlfriend, but yeah. You're going back and playing with dead things and in dead places, and that can never give you life. It's going to give you more heartbreak, more depression, more anxiety, because God has called you out of that. He's delivered you from it. We must get up out of the graveyard. Let the things that God buried be buried. Mm, that's good. You see, when the devil gets a hold of people, here, here's one of the biggest lies of the enemy. I just want to be alone right now. I just want to be alone right now. That's a dangerous place to be. That's a dangerous place to be. I think solitude is good for a moment, like maybe go for a hike, go on a fishing trip, spend a night away hiking or camping, that, that's fine. But long-term solitude will break your mind. Have you ever watched the show on Netflix called Alone? It's a 60 to 90 day challenge where people have to go completely alone into the wilderness and survive. And they have to videotape themselves. I mean, by day 30, they're like crazy. They like lost their mind. And, and it's a show. Like, <laughs> this is what happens when the enemy will get into your mind. You begin to seclude and cut yourself away. I think that's one of the most dangerous things that happened during the pandemic. Was the amount of solitude and, and, and aloneness. And, 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 and maybe I'm talking to somebody online. You still, you still haven't come back out. And, and listen, we're, we've been living Bible prophecy. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as like has been a custom of some. There's a danger when we don't come together as the body of Christ and worship together. This man was driven in solitude and isolation by the devil. And he's crying out and cutting himself. He's being tormented day and night. Never having a moment to just relax and be at peace. This man had no relief. He had no peace of mind. He had no hope. In the natural, it looked like he was beyond hope. That's why these people put him in the graveyard. Might as well get ready for death. Might as well be around death because you're doomed. But I love this story because when it looks like there's no hope, hope walks in on the scene. Hope walks into his life. Hope walks into his moment at just the right time. You see, because Jesus not only paid the price for this man to be born again and for his body to be healed, but Jesus has also paid the price, and someone get this today, for you to have peace of mind. If you deal with something in your mind, if you deal with something in your emotions, hear me, if you deal with anger, if you deal with sadness, if you deal with depression or anxiety, you need to make 2 Timothy 1.7 a life verse. This needs to be something that you speak over yourself every single day. Write it down, 2 Timothy 1.7, put it on your mirror, for God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sound mind. I love it in the Amplified. It says this, for God did not give you the spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craving, of cringing, of fawning fear. But he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a calm and well balanced mind 
and discipline and self-control. I love that. I love that. The Bible says this, let peace have its perfect work. Let it bring about self-control. Let it bring about discipline. Let it bring about a well-balanced mind. Use your faith for a sound mind just like you would use your faith for everything else. All right, let's keep going. Mark 5, 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out, you unclean spirit. Okay? The man did the running towards Jesus. The man. The man fell down and worshipped. The man wanted deliverance. The man did not know who Jesus was. The demon did not come and worship Jesus, but the demon did know who Jesus was. You got to know this. Every principality, every power, every force of darkness, they absolute, absolutely know the name of Jesus. They absolutely know the name of Jesus. This demon was not one to come worship him. This man wanted deliverance. He wanted freedom, so he approached Jesus. He came out of his hiding place. He came out of the tomb. He came out of the graveyard and pursued freedom. If you want freedom from something in your life, you need to pursue it. And pursuing it is not simply Googling it. If there's something in your life that you need freedom from, you need support. You need to come out of your house, you need to come out of your place and come to a group, come out to Thursday nights, come out to church, come out to a place you can connect your faith with other people and get freedom. This demon needed no introduction as to who Jesus was. The man was running to Jesus and while on his way, Jesus commands the spirits to come out of him. And this is what's so funny. The spirits are tormenting the man, but the spirits beg Jesus, please don't torment us. Right? So they can dish out some torment, but they can't take it. I've been running, I've been running day camp uh, the last few weeks with uh, five-year-olds to 12-year-olds. I got a few little knuckleheads in my group. I'm not going to tell you which one of your kids is a knucklehead. But there's a few, there's a few little knuckleheads in the group. And, 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 and they play this game. They play this game. I want to be around the water play, but don't get me wet. But then they'll pick up the bazooka water gun and spray everybody. But then when they get sprayed, ah, I said I didn't want to get wet. And I'm like, bro, you play, you pay. They know straight out, you get me wet, I'm dumping ice cold water on your head, a bucket, right? These demons, they're tormenting this guy day and night, but when a bigger bully shows up, someone who's got more power than them, now realize they've been breaking chains, they've been breaking shackles, but someone more powerful than them walks on the scene. Please don't torment us. How could it be that Jesus would have tormented them? It would have been torment to them if Jesus cast them out but did not let them go into a body. I don't have time today to do a sermon on demonology, but a demon cannot manifest outside of a body. Unlike an angelic being. An angelic being can manifest, can appear in human form, in a bodily form, without body. Okay? So these demons, and I, I just don't have time to go into it, but these demons are saying, please don't just cast us into the abyss. Let us go into something. Because it would have been torment to them to not be in it. Okay? Verse 9. Then he asked them, what is your name? And they answered him saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. This one demon that is speaking 
is kind of the leader of thousands of demons that are in this person's body. In this time, in the Roman army, a legion of soldiers would be a minimum of 1,200 soldiers. 1,200 minimum. We know that it's at least 2,000 because it says that it went into over 2,000 pigs. This is how many demons are in this one man, in this one individual. Mark 5.10. Also he begged him earnestly, do not send us out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding near the mountainside, so all the demons begged him, saying, send us into the pigs that we may enter them. And this bothers me. This bothers me that Jesus would even give them permission. It bothers me that he would even entertain this. Why not just condemn them to the abyss? Why not just cast them out? Why even have this conversation? And here's the answer. And we, we may not like it. Because it wasn't time yet. It wasn't their time yet. Do you remember when Mary goes to Jesus, she says, turn water into wine or get some wine? And he says, woman, why you bother me? It's not my time yet. You see, God is very careful to not violate a timeline that he has set. And it wasn't time yet for the demons to be condemned to the abyss. Let's look. Matthew 8, 29. Another perspective of the same story. And suddenly I cried out saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus, son of David? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Before the time? You see, the demons know that there is going to be a time. There is going to be a time where Jesus is going to deal with it all. Where he is going to judge heaven and earth, and he's going to judge Satan, and there's going to be the lake of fire and all this kind of stuff. But they also know it's not the time yet. Right? Luke 8, 31. And they begged him, please do not command us to be thrown into the abyss. It wasn't time. Eventually, one day they will. Not yet. I want you to understand that Jesus was not extending them mercy. He was not. He was following the plan of his father. It simply wasn't time. They also didn't, they said, please don't cast us out of this country. I want you to understand that demons' spirituality is regional. If you've ever traveled either stateside or outside of the states, you could go to a different state or a different place and feel just like a sense of depression or yuck or whatever in different cities because demons are regional. They are assigned to specific places. And this group of demons have worked very hard to be in that region and to have an influence there. Okay? And this one guy walks in with authority from heaven and is going to ruin all their work, they're begging him, please, don't cast us out of here. All right? Verse 13. And at once Jesus gave them permission. That bothers me. That bothers me. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There's about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down a steep hill and drowned in the sea. They, they went to the abyss anyway. So now I'm, now I'm even more annoyed because I'm a businessman. I'm like, you also destroyed someone's business. 2,000 pigs, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of pork chops. That, that's a lot of chuleta. That's a lot of penny. Hey. <laughs> right into the sea. Why, Jesus, would you destroy someone's business. You see, Gadarene was not a Jewish region. It was pagan land. Pagan, pagan land. They worship the devil. They worship idols. Pagan, P-A-G-A-N. You see, because Jews would never raise pigs. Pigs are unclean. You know, the pig actually represents hypocrisy it's an animal of hypocrisy it's it's 
Here's what was happening. You ready for this? Here's what was happening. Jews are not allowed to eat pork. But at night, they would sneak over to Gadarene and get a little boneless spare rib. They sneak out. See, they were getting some black market pork. <laughs> Jesus, owed, Jesus owed them nothing. Jesus owed this pagan region nothing. She so says, whatever. You want to go into the pigs? Whatever. I condemn them anyway. It's unclean. Unclean spirits going to unclean animals. Men who were selling their pigs to people who shouldn't be eating it. And people who were judging other people for eating it, they were eating it. <laughs> the whole region is corrupt. That's why verse 17 it says, and when Jesus had done all these things, they asked him to leave. They liked their pagan ways. They didn't want Jesus going and messing up all the stuff that they had done. Uh, come on, somebody. So those who fed the swine... Told everybody in the city and the country what happened. See, city and in country. Gadarene and Gerasene. They went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the one who had been demon-possessed, who had a legion, sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. People are so fickle. They were afraid of the demon-possessed man. Now, they're afraid of the one who delivered the demon-possessed man. Isn't this wild? It's wild. Mark 5, 16. And those who saw it told them how it had happened about the demon-possessed man and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. The people wanted the deliverer to leave. They wanted the miracle to leave. They wanted salvation to leave. It's a lot like America lately. We want truth and goodness and wholeness to leave. For the first time in our history, we're a post-Christian generation. The kids that we're getting in church today or, or, or we're seeing in our schools today are the first generation that are raised in homes of people that have never been to church. They neither have a bad thought of church nor a good thought of church. They're kind of a blank slate. They've never been. They've never heard. Now look at this last section I want to point out today. Talking to somebody that's got something going with their mind. Mark 5, 18 and 19. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him, let me go with you. Let me go with you. Let me get out of here. I just want to be with you. You're all I want. You're all I need. But there's a problem with that. There's a problem with that. And it's what I see in a lot of evangelical church today. A lot of evangelical church wants to keep Jesus in the building. They want to keep Jesus in the building because they only want perfect people to come in. You got to get fixed first, then you can come to our church because we don't want you to corrupt our church. I don't want someone with sin sitting next to me. I don't want someone with problems sitting next to me. I don't want my kids around those kind of people. And that's what's kind of happening, right? But let's, let's, let's isolate ourselves from the world. Let's insulate ourselves from the world. That's never what the gospel was. That's never what church was supposed to be. Church was never supposed to be simply a refining place for Christians. Church was supposed to be a place where the lost could find hope. Amen. Watch this. Jesus didn't let him. But he said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. And how he had mercy on you. Here's what I know. Here's what I know. God loves using 
the biggest piece of garbage in the room to become an evangelist. He loves using the person with the biggest mistakes, the worst reputation. He takes Saul of Tarsus and turns him into Paul, the apostle, to preach to the nations. He takes people with hurts, habits, hang-ups, with brokenness, a bad history, a current situation, and he says, I want to use you. The man who once needed deliverance is now being used as an instrument of deliverer. Go. Tell somebody what God is doing in your life. Man, listen, you can't keep it to yourself. You can't keep this to yourself. What a shame. What a shame for any of us who have 5,000 Facebook friends to go to heaven without any of them. Shame. Shame that you had the answer to eternal life. You had the truth of the gospel, of the one way to heaven, and you kept it to yourself. That's the story of the three men given talents. One given ten, one given five, one given one. The one got it. He got the blessing. He got eternal life. He got salvation. But he hid it. Didn't duplicate it. Didn't tell anybody. Didn't reinvest it. The master comes back and says, depart from me, you wicked servant. Wicked servant, you didn't even get interest on it. You didn't even use it to serve the house of God. You didn't even use your salvation to reach your children. Now listen, I'm not putting anybody down today. I'm just saying the urgency of this message. The urgency of this gospel is no, go home and tell your family. Tell your neighbors how good God is. Not how bad God is. Listen, stop making those judgment posts. Stop making political posts. Come on. As if politics has anything to do with your eternity. I will tell you a fun fact in my closing. I did get a call this week from a political party, and they asked if they could use the building to do a political rally, and I said, no, thank you. Just so you know. They pushed pretty hard. And if you're into politics, you may be very upset at me that I didn't let somebody do it. But I don't pick a side. I want to do a series, Jesus and Politics. I don't know if people will come out or not. But I want you to understand this. Anytime Jesus was put in a position where he had to choose a side politically... His answer was, well, in my kingdom. In my kingdom, we do this. Here in my heart, I don't care what side of the aisle you are on. I don't care if you're red or blue. That means nothing to me. I will never say, you will never hear me say, well, if you're red, you can't go to heaven. If you're blue, you can't go to heaven. That, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Politics had nothing to do with that. But what I will say is, you are part of a bigger political party, and that's called the kingdom of God. And there's a different set of rules and standards in the kingdom than there are in this land. All right? Just throwing it out there today. The man who needed deliverance is now being used to deliver. You want to get over anxiety? You want to get over depression? You want to get over anger and a poor self-image? You need to give out what God has given to you. Psychology tells us that people who are continually giving and training and teaching are happier, more full of joy, have less depression, less anxiety than people who don't. Jesus knows something we don't know. He says, go home, share it. Share it. Tell your story. Tell your testimony. Tell others the good news of Jesus. Now today, 
this story and this deliverance is only available to those who are in Christ. It's only available to those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The Bible tells us, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind stays on him. Great is your peace and your undisturbed composure, but those are promises to children of God. How do you become a child of God? How do you become a Christian? Well, Romans 10 and 9 tells us that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. That's it. That's, that's the prerequisite. That's the standard. Believing and speaking. And as I believe, that I have to act upon what I believe, and it begins to change my life. If you're here today or you're watching online, and you've never come out of the grave towards Jesus, I'm inviting you today. I'm inviting you to take that step to fall at the feet of Jesus and surrender to him. And we do that by praying a prayer. And it goes like this if you repeat with me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel, and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.